<laughs> that wasn't me saying wow. <laughs> that was Rubia. I left that. That was um hi everybody. How you doing? Uh that was Rubia Masad playing his 71, his vintage 71 plus Paul custom on the Victory VC35 Copper launch video, um, which I, I got permission from Victory to use, and I'm going to use the clip in the um in the in the final video clip, of course. Um, hey, everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, I think I said in the description, whether you looked or not, I'm not sure. Um, let me do some housekeeping. The 5 Watt World live stream, of course, is brought to you with the support of the boys at Ish Guitars. There's a link in the, for Ish in the description, and I'll talk more about Ish later on in the stream. Um, as I said in the description, we're sort of doing this upside down um, because I was able to schedule pair. I'm prepared with slides today. Pear Nielsen. The funny thing about this picture, two couple things. This is an older model of his Singularity. I think that's somebody count. Is that the eight string that he used with Meshuggah? Um, and um, the thing that's funny to me is every time I see a picture of Pear on Instagram or a little movie clip or something, he's always grinning. <laughs> he's, he, he's like the the perfect uh, Swedish gnome, Viking gnome. I always tease him about it. Um, and um, Anyway, so Pear Nielsen has agreed to be on. He's got a new Strandberg uh, model. He Pear is probably one of, uh, he's not on the stream now. I, I'll, I'll embarrass him. Um, Pear is probably one of the greatest living improvisers, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, I turned Beato on to him um, and uh, they've talked on the phone, but Pear's a monster. Um, and um, I, I was kind of limited the number of slides and things I could put here today. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll run clips of him when we have him on. He's, he's got a clip playing an eight string and a weird tuning that I used on the Strandberg video. And that's how I originally got acquainted with him. I've only ever spoken, well, I've um, communicated with him by email. I've never spoken to him on the phone. We're excited to kind of get it and hang out. Uh, his band Scar Symmetry is back out on the road. And before that, of course, he toured with the band Mashuga for many, many years, playing the lead parts in that band when Frederick Torgdahl didn't want to be out on the road during those years. Um, and as some of you are surprised that I'm interested in that corner of metal, well, you're just going to have to wait for the pair thing. I actually went through um, kind of a rock, heavy rock period, um, I don't know, late 2008, nine. Listen to a lot of Meshuggah, Sepultura, all, all kinds of heavy music. That was, but that was the time. Um, so uh, I want to thank um, this guy, Baby Ninja. <laughs> Baby's traveling for the holiday, and I gave him the, you know, the classic Keith Williams six hours notice, and he didn't even blink like he never does. I want to thank him for being here. Uh, and um, again, we'll, we're living in the world where we try to stump Baby. Back here, get myself back on screen if I can. Ah, there we go. So um, today we're talking about Les Paul Customs. You know, this is upside down because I usually like to do the follow up after the videos come out. The video is going to come out next Thursday morning for um, regular folks on the channel. If you're a member of the Five Watt World, friends of Five Watt on Patreon at the ten dollars or more level, you'd be able to see it Wednesday night next week. Everybody gets those guys get an early glimpse at the videos. This is a shameless plug for Friends of 5 Watt. I, I love to have the community there because I get a lot of communication with those guys and gals over there. It's great. Um, uh, Perry's got the script. We're on uh, on schedule to get that together and get it shot right after the holiday and then edit it and then put it out next week. Um, so there's always things that don't that won't fit in the script in my, you know, I try to limit, especially these days, they seem to do much, much better um, that um, that they're running more like between 20 and 25 minutes. Uh, when they break 30 minutes, the short histories, uh, I get a lot more grief about them not being that short. Um, and they just do better. And frankly, getting more people educated on the stuff is is something that I'm, I'm very into. And obviously getting views is a big part of the whole uh, show here. Um, so I'm going to talk about custom stuff, some so stories that didn't fit in the script. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really cool things that, that relate to actually m like how I originally saw customs in the first place. Um, I'd like everybody, if you're, um, I had somebody actually already say that they just recently got a 79 custom. If you have a custom or you're just a, a Les Paul um, nerd, or you didn't know that's what we were talking about today because you missed the thumbnail and I love it that you're just here for the stream if that's true um 
get in the chat and tell me where you're uh, logged on from and um, you know what where the first place you came up with uh, seeing because I, I remember vividly I'm going to tell you about it um, the first time I saw a custom or thought I was looking at a custom um, and um, and just to be clear today whenever I say custom I'm not talking about the custom shop the custom shop started in 1994 at Gibson and um, the first Les Paul custom came out in 1950. And I'm going to talk about a couple of things, just sort of broad strokes, because I think it's one of the things that is misunderstood that I'm going to want to talk about. Um, it's good to see so many uh, familiar names in the in the chat. I'm going to open this up a little longer so I can see everybody. If you have a specific question, go ahead and put at five watt world in front of it, uh, as Chris Butler has done. Les Paul custom three pickup guitars always confused me. I'm a symbol man. <laughs> it's only three positions. I'm going to cover that in the video. I'll maybe answer it for you here because I'm always surprised by that myself. And a lot of people mod them. So um, so if we have in Les Paul Custom Enthusiasts or others, uh, let's talk about them here. Um, so uh, for me, Les Paul Customs came into my consciousness with this image in 1975. Let me get this full screen. There we go. Well, I didn't buy as much, did it? Um, and of course, this is the cover of Kiss Alive. I was 15 years old. I was uh, probably going into my sophomore year in high school. In uh, I'm from a rural, very rural school district in upstate New York. I think I said in the script, if, uh, if it gets past Perry's um, uh, scrutiny, that um, my memory of this was um, that all of a sudden everybody was playing this um, in their, their muscle cars as they drove out of the parking lot at my high school everybody's notebook all of a sudden had the KISS logo, you know, in ink, uh, penciled onto the French notebook or whatever. Um, it was just a real phenomenon. It wasn't their first record, of course, it was their fourth record, but it was absolutely the record that um, came blasting onto the scene. Um, I'm going to come back to this, but the next thing that happened the very next year is this record came out. This is actually an image. Um, I think this is a print of the image that was used. If you folded out the original double album or for Frampton Comes Alive, and this is Peter Frampton. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these guitars. Um, Frampton Comes Alive was a gigantic record, and it was the very next year, 1976. And then the year after that, this record came out, though I didn't see it till 1978. And this is L.D. Miola's Elegant Gypsy. And um, that is a two pickup custom, it's actually 1974, two pickup custom, and it's got DiMarzios. Everybody at that time was just immediately swapping out DiMarzios, though these are not the ubiquitous um, super distortions. These are dual tone, so splittable. And he had switches, you can see them just on there. You can see switches um, around, well, actually he doesn't even have the right number of dials, does he? Okay, I don't know how much customization happened on Al's guitar. Um, There, can you hear me now? This isn't hardware, it's software. 
We back? Sorry, guys. I'm overdue for uh, audio. Yes, we're back. Thanks, John. Okay, yeah. So um, you can do this where you can have an image up and talk, or you can do it and not talk and not be heard. Anyway, so clearly I had done that. So what I was saying here is, um, uh, boy, how long ago did I lose you? So uh, did you get the part about Elegant Gypsy? Was I going rambling on about that? How far back in the script do I have to go? I, I do notes for these things, you know? Anyway, let me talk about Ace Freely. I was saying that um, uh, I need to talk about Ace Freely because I had left him out of the overall Les Paul video and I shouldn't have, and he even owned a 59 and I shouldn't have left him out of that either, the burst video. So he should have been there. So I'm doing penance uh, today. So, um, oh, okay. Thanks, Perry. Perry's saying I was just talking about, so it was after the Elegant Gypsy thing. So it was when I went here. So um, if you look here, this is a three pickup guitar, but it is not a custom because there's no block inlay on the first fret. And my understanding is from reading, doing research this last week or so, that um, at the time of a live, when they you know, would have been shooting this for the cover of this, um, he didn't own a custom. He got the custom immediately after um, they did this tour. He got his first custom, which was a black, um, black beauty. And it was a, um, so they were both newer guitars. They were after they reissued the guitars in 68. So in broad strokes, um, customs were built from 1954 to 1960 when they went to the SG-61 uh, body style in uh, 1961. And then they didn't bring those back until the single cut Les Pauls came back in 1968. Um, so these guitars um, that Ace had were built after 68. I don't know what year the black one is, but the bright cherry burst. Let's see if I can do this. There, now we got it. So this Cherry Burst three pickup is really interesting. He bought, this is this is the only time they had made a Cherry Burst custom up to that point in time was um, the 20th anniversary guitars in 1974. And so according to Ace, he bought this guitar at Manny's Music and had them install the third pickup as a custom at the time. Because when they came back in 68, instead of coming back with the way they had 57, 58, you know, uh, 57 when the humbuckers came on, they went to a three pickup custom vast majority, there were exceptions, but those were all custom order guitars late in the fifties. They went to a two pickup guitar, but he always loved the look of a three pickup guitar. Um, and we're going to come back to this with the Frampton thing in a second here. But, um, so the three pickup guitar, these were, these were super distortion DiMarzio's and the black one, supposedly, um, he had the third pickup added to the black, uh, beauty that he had, but it was never functional. And at one time it was really wasn't even a pickup. It was a plastic insert made to look enough like a pickup to pass muster on stage, um, which I thought was, I, I love that story. I love it when stuff is like that. Um, so uh, yeah, actually I moved my mic position this week. So hopefully this sounds better. So that's Ace Freely. Um, and I'm limited to the total number of slides I can use. So I apologize. I had lots of really cool slides of Aces. So, and then if we go to Frampton, I didn't know this before we did this. And um, probably some of you know the story that uh, Peter Frampton's guitar is called the Phoenix because um, he played this guitar as his main guitar from 1970 to 1980. And in 1980, when he was in South America, there was a, um... <laughs> Emery Smith says, I hated Kiss. That jumped right off the screen there, Emery. Thanks, man. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, uh, so the the guitar was um, believed to have been destroyed because the um, cargo plane that was carrying all the band's gear crashed. Um, and then 30 years later, he actually was offered the guitar back and then um, they put it back together for him and he's playing it now. I could have, if I had the space for it, I could have put up a modern picture of Peter Frampton playing that guitar. The coolest thing about this is that I, because of the year that it came out, immediately assumed incorrectly that Peter's guitar um, is a, you know, a reissue 68, 70, someplace in that 68 to 76, or I guess he started playing in 1970, 1970. So it would have been a 68 or a 69 or a 70. Um, in fact, this is a 1954 uh, Les Paul that would have originally had P90s and, uh, and a staple pickup in the neck that had been modified before Peter got it. This is just the way it was. 
and we can double back now, Chris, and I'll answer your question because it is in my script. Um, the answer to the three pickup positions is um, the neck position only, neck, um, sorry, neck position only, middle and bridge, and bridge position only. So that's, uh, that's the story of um, Peter's and every, all the three pickup guitars were wired that way. But Peter's guitar is actually a 54. So it's fascinating in that it crosses over um, the history of these. Um, and I think that's really, really cool. Um, El Demiola's guitar uh, was sort of in the news because um, sometime during COVID, he was doing these, um, actually Rick went to one, uh, Beata went to and had dinner uh, at Al's house, not with a bunch of people, but Demiola was running a thing where people could kind of uh, buy a meal with him. And by all accounts, he's an amazing cook. And so he would um, have people over at his house, he'd cook them a meal, they'd all hang out and they'd talk guitars and they'd have these amazing nights. I understood that they were uh, expensive uh, meals to say the least. So, um, uh, so Dimiola announced sometime during COVID and he's been playing PRS, you know, signature guitars or custom shop, private stock, whatever you want to say, guitars for a long time. Um, but he, uh, he said that he's thinking about selling this guitar. It's a 1974, um, and 74 is a, is a big year for, um, Les Pauls, a lot of famous Les Pauls, especially the cream ones were 74s. Um, and, uh, and the joke that he said, I put in the comments at the beginning was that he, um, uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about selling that guitar. It's a great guitar. It weighs about 400 pounds, uh, which I thought was hysterical. Um, one of the ones I didn't mention, but I came across the story and absolutely loved is John Fogarty from Claire, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. Um, he actually used a um, Rickenbacker 325. And if you folks are scholars of Rickenbacker history, that's a guitar that... Um, uh, John Lennon used. It's a very short scale guitar. Um, I've read it in centimeters, but um, it's basically almost 21 inches, 20.9 inches or something long, right? So that was the guitar he used on really all the early appearances, etc. cetera. And um, <laughs> Chris, did you go to Demiola's house? He said that he's heard that uh, Chris, that Demiola's wife's an even better cook. Uh, well, you know, it could be. I didn't get to go. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, the cool story about um, him using customs is this. He so he had this Rickenbacker they absolutely loved to use. He and then he started using the um, really short scale, you know, up at pitch. And then he started doing a lot of the famous, most famous tunes are the entire guitar tuned down to D standard. So a whole step down, you know, and it's got that big, you know, chiming yet, you know, full kind of sound. Um, just amazing sound. And he liked the really, and he just used regular, his typical gauge strings. He liked how loose they felt, really liked that. So come to find out one of his uh, customs was destroyed. Um, the neck was broken clean off in a, in a uh, tour accident. He took it to his, um, <laughs> uh, he took it to his repair guy. I'm laughing at Perry's jumping in um, at, um, and he had, he actually had a new neck built with the original, you know, hardware and everything, but built as a 21 inch, you know, basically the same scale as his, um, as his Rickenbacker and he put a big B on it. So he'd get the tremolo effects that he had from the, from the Rickenbacker that he'd actually stopped using. And, uh, so he had this incredibly short, um, uh, Rick, um, and I couldn't find any pictures where I thought that it was absolutely clear that that's what he had. Um, they had this really short necked, um, Fogarty has this really short necked, uh, custom. So one of my favorite, uh, Les Paul custom stories. Um, let me do some, uh, questions here. So Perry want to jump in with another important custom 2001 white custom that Justin Hawkins used for permission to land Eurovision and one way ticket. There you go. There's a lot of them, you know, is what's interesting. Uh, and the, the, there was a fellow at the beginning of the stream who bought a 79. Um, so like a lot of times I turned to my buddy, Dave Honorado and got a lot of specifics and I needed to brush up and make sure that I knew what dates Gibson went to using three piece maple necks. And it was from late 75 to early in 81. Um, so that guitar that, uh, was mentioned at the top of the stream, it definitely has a maple neck. The interesting thing is, um, and there are people who love that maple neck sound, you know, a lot of the long scale 
pretty much all the long scale jazz guitars that Gibson made have that long neck. So um, uh, that's a good question, Chris. I'm going to come back to that. So, um, but you what you find is there are a lot of people, a lot of the famous Les Pauls, whether it's Lindsay and Buckingham's um, white 74, which he basically only used for the rumors tour or the edge. I think his white Les Paul custom is a 74. Or then you go to the other side of it and Zach Wilde plays basically 81s, his favorite ones. He first one he got was a 1981 and 1981 was the first year they went back to the one piece mahogany neck. So they kind of bracket those with the most famous ones, the ones that I came up with. Oh, there were a lot of other famous ones um, that uh, that weren't there. So, Chris, uh, I'll only answer, answer your question. So were all the Les Paul customs fitted? So um, Chris is referring to the fact that Les Paul had a tremendous amount of input. By the time they got around to issuing the 50, the custom at 54, um, he was in a meeting and supposedly the story goes that originally he wanted to do two guitars and he, he was absolutely sure he wanted a gold guitar and when they he was literally got up to go to the bathroom and as he turned it back at the door they said yeah but what other color before you leave and he said black and that's how the two guitars got made um and he want he liked these frets very low um by some accounts the people that got to play less's guitars kind of worn out um he thought they were faster i thought it gave him faster it actually by most accounts hurt the sales of the guitars in the original run from 54 to 1960 through 1960. Um, only 1,920 Les Paul Customs were shipped from Gibson between 1954 and 1960. And across that same period of time, there were over 7,000 gold top Les Pauls, um, you know, coming right up to the, right through, I should say, the sunburst area, the burst era. So, uh, so no, the pickups, the, the um, things weren't there. When they brought the guitars back in 1968, and actually you've provided the perfect segue, um, uh, I think Randy Rhodes, Joe, Joe C says Randy Rhodes, white, Les Paul stands out. I think that Randy's was a 74 as well. Uh, and those dates, that dates would make sense because what year did Jakey Lee start with, uh, Ozzy because Zach took over from Jakey Lee. Anyway, somebody here knows more about that than I do. I'm sure. Um, when they brought the guitars back in 1968, they brought them back with regular frets. In many ways, when they brought the custom back, the single pickup, the single cutaway guitars, they came back instead of three pickup guitars, which they'd had at the PAF era, um, and they um, brought them back with regular frets. And they actually, the big thing that I wanted to talk about, the thing that often is debated, is that from 1954 to 1960, to the end of that first run, the guitars didn't have a maple cap like the rest of the Les Pauls. They were an all mahogany guitar. Les really liked that tone. He liked how much warmer the all mahogany guitars were. Um, uh, Chris, is, Chris Quinn is jumping in. I think he's saying the same thing. Um, so the fact is um, the maple caps were preferred probably tone wise. And when they came back in 68, they basically were building fancy, really fancy regular Les Pauls. Um, so. Um, Thanks. So um, the so the thing that's amazing is I've actually I, I, I somehow knew that they were all mahogany guitars. But like is often the case, I kind of blurred that over the whole time that they were always produced. Um, <laughs> that somebody's saying, yeah, 7000 made 20,000 remain. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like the old burst joke um, that and that's not true either. So when I was arguing with Rick, when Rick was looking, Rick was look, looking for a 74 at one time. He ended up buying a 94. Um, actually, he bought a 74 and it arrived with the neck broken. Heartbreaking. Um, sent it back, got his money back. And then he moved to, um, he moved, he found later, uh, Dave Honorado helped him find a 94, which is also a very good year um, when they were starting to kind of get back on their feet. So um, that's a very cool guitar. All right. So there was some other stuff in here I wanted to touch on before, because I want to do, I want to answer questions about Paul Ewing, my buddy, Paul. Um, I almost feel like I should try to say that with a British accent, Paul. Um, I was talking to Chris Butler, but he was talking here earlier about how he got one. All right, I'm not going to come up with it. So, um, oh, Actually, one of the other guitars I wanted to talk about today, I didn't pull the pictures for. I wouldn't have had space for them anyway. There's a guitar player that I know um, uh, from New York, 
and um, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to butcher his last name here, but I talked to him yesterday on the phone. And Steve owns a Cherry Burst Custom that were done in a very limited run. And it was one of the guitars that uh, was in that run was the guitar that Neil Schoen plays on any way you want it on the, you can see it on the video. It's a cherry burst two pickup custom and it has split block inlays. It was a very fancy run of guitars that a retiring, um, this is before the custom shop, uh, but a guy who was retiring one of the top builders at Gibson, they let him do a run of guitars and he used really high end wood and he built these. And this, friend of mine from New York has one of these guitars. Um, and, uh, I might, I'm, I might end up using a video clip if it's not a copyright problem, uh, in there. So <laughs> thanks for coming, Jeff. Uh, Jeff actually was out at Watchtower Guitars yesterday. And, um, you know, if I, if I tempt all of you with, uh, with this stuff, just think how hard it is for Jeff and I, when, uh, when in fact, uh, you know, we talk about this stuff all the time. I talk to Jeff almost every day. So he, he actually came across a Murphy Lab 57 reissue. So, you know, this, ma this mahogany versus maple top thing is very relevant in the current custom shop world stuff. So when something is like a two pickup guitar, but it says it's a 57, you're kind of like, well, 57, almost all of them were three pickup guitars, you know, like Jimmy Page's, somebody said earlier. Um, the, uh, the reality is that a custom shop 57 reissue um, should be all mahogany. It should be an all mahogany guitar. So when you look, like matter of fact, Wildwood Guitars just gave me permission to use some of their clips in the video if I wanted of Greg Koch playing a, a batch. They got a batch of custom shop special run 57 reissues and um, and is really amazing. Uh, it, I mean, it's Greg, he's incredible, um, but beautiful guitars and they are all mahogany. So over the years, you know, the problem is you have to read these specs very carefully. And it's really one of the reasons why you would, you know, nerd out and go all the way down the rabbit hole. Cause if you ever found yourself interested in buying it, but you wanted to make sure you got a certain kind of spec, then that's something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, the other clips that I found, there's an amazing clip of JD Simo playing a 55 and he uses the neck pickup a lot, which is the staple pickup. And uh, there's a clip uh, both from Carter Vintage uh, and there's a clip of, um, was it Jared James Nichols? Um, just rocking out on a 57 three pickup. Uh, guitar. So hopefully I'll be using those. Um, <laughs> Son of a bitch says, I got a new Gibson. I'm just breaking in the headstock. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, so uh, get a shovel. My first live stream is about my dream guitar. It's a good day. Oh, to own one one day. Yeah, actually in the script, I wrote something like um, that these three artists set my dreams going about uh, customs and that's all they ever have been is uh, is dreams of customs. Um, uh, I, as, as people know, I ended up getting an R9 after years and years of looking, only to sort of not fall in love with the ergonomics of it. Um, I spend money on really good guitars when it when it takes me, um, but uh, but yeah, I just I'm not a Les Paul guy. There are a lot of you out there though I know. Um, so uh, so if you have questions about sort of the history, it's all fresh in my head because I just did all the research and it'll be here for a few weeks and then God help me, I'll remember more than I should in the long run. But um, let's see, Kevin Crafts has seen a whole bunch of LPs, Les Paul's on Trogley guitar, Manny, he, he loads them up. Some gorgeous to look at, it's like Les Paul porn. Yeah, it's not hard to find Les Paul porn um, with tops, etc. cetera. Uh, New York Shelby GT 500, yeah, good title. So the 50s Les Paul gold top and Black Beauty guitars were all mahogany while bursts have a maple top. No, the Les Paul gold top from 1952, from the inception, uh, those guitars always had a maple cap, very thick maple cap. And as you probably maybe have read over the years, the dish, uh, the carving of the dish is deeper on the earlier guitars. There's kind of more maple there. But the Black Beauties, when they decided to bring those out in 54, they are an all mahogany guitar. So if I was talking too fast and wasn't clear about that, let me be clear about that now. Um, Well, somebody, uh, Deja Vu is saying, what about the brief Rich-like period? Um, the interesting thing um, is uh, Rich-like is one thing, but actually in the, is it the early 80s when they did maple fretboard Les Pauls? And it's kind of like, you know, the, it was the end of the Norlin era when they would put out guitars for, you know, a week and a half and it'd be anything. It'd be like whatever, you know, um, and that's that the, the maple guitars were then. Um, so. Uh, 
let me uh, let me go ahead and pay some bills here. Uh, the Five Watt World live stream is brought to you with the support of Ish Guitars. Ish stocks a carefully curated set of brands, including PRS, Dingwall, Martin, Specter, Strandberg, Music Man, Gretsch, Federa, Heritage, Ritter, Ibanez, Taylor, Vox, and Victory, to name just a few. Actually, I was told the other day that they actually are a Line 6 dealer. Um, and I told them that with all the stomp stuff that I do, and there's a stack of catalysts right behind me there. And that's what's in, this, in the music room right now. Um, that they might get more traffic from uh, from my uh, talking about it. Uh, since opening in 2014, Ish has grown to be one of the top PRS private stock dealers and wood library dealers in the world. Uh, they also deal in vintage pieces, having had a 1960 vintage Les Paul come through and a 56. The 56 is still there, uh, come through the shop in just the last few months. The shop excels in working with manufacturers to carry limited runs of instruments with unique features, woods, colors, to name it. They highlight the fact that every instrument's unique and that the unique instruments are worth pursuing. Uh, most of the guys in the shop, it's run by musicians. Everybody who answers the phone is a musician. Um, it isn't an exaggeration to say that I moved to Syracuse in part to work with these guys. They're just amazing. Um, so, um, I've just had so much fun working with them. I'll actually be running over there tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to thank Ish for their support in the live stream. That's really been fun. All right, we got questions now. Chris Butler wants to know, how were the stock pickups wound in the three pickup and the two pickup Les Paul Customs hotter than PAFs, darker? Well, um, at that period from 57, when they went to the three pickups, uh, I, the, the two pickup guitars were a whole other bag, you know, when they came back and I actually didn't read a lot about the two pickups in 68, 69, 70 in there. Um, 68, 69, 70. Yeah. In the early 60, late sixties, early seventies, when they came back, the early ones probably were just, they're all humbucking. So they're just the same. They were exactly coming out of the same bin. The only difference was they had gold covers and by all accounts, the gold, um, made the pickups even a little darker yet that it was, you know, sort of uh, like a nickel cover, you know, what people pulling like um, Clapton pulling the covers off his less his humbuckers to get a little bit brighter tone. Uh, that was it. Uh, so that you could the, the gold ones even sort of blocked a little more high end. Um, Kevin Kraft says, thanks for the stream. Much appreciated. My pleasure to be here, Kevin. So Steve Moore, hey, Steve wants to know where does Frampton's guitar fall in this category? You mean uh, is it an all mahogany guitar? Yes, it's a 1954. So it absolutely would be an all mahogany guitar. And I, I don't know that those are DiMarzios. Um, I don't know what pickups are in that guitar. I didn't go down that rabbit hole because it's the kind of level of detail I can't squeeze into every video. There's a few guitars that I might make a video just about that one guitar. Um, and that guitar is one of them. The Frampton guitar story is such a great story. Um, another one is... Um, uh, of course, Brian May's Red One. Uh, I have a list. Pearly Gates, maybe, you know, um, although I guess there is a great, Jeff turned me on to the fact that I didn't know there's a great book where Billy Gibbons had, talks about his guitar collection and the, and the tunes that he played him on. Um, Billy sort of famously stretches, or, sorry, doesn't let the facts get in the way of a great story is the best way I like to put that. Um, but if he wrote a book about it, maybe that's worth, I'm going to order it up and see where we are. Um, James Lee says his 1974 Les Paul Cherry Burst Custom had the worst mismatched three-piece top. Hmm. Well, it was the 70s. It was Norlin. I'm not surprised. I'm, and by most accounts, those guitars are really heavy. And of course, I started driving in 1976. And as you probably heard me say before, and actually I was just at the House of Guitars uh, about a month ago with my buddy David Casson, um, that um, the first place I ever went when I told my parents I needed to borrow the car was I think they thought I was going into Lyons for a couple of hours to visit a friend and I drove to Rondequoit and went to the House of Guitars. <laughs> I really shouldn't have. I wasn't a good enough driver at that point. But the thing I remember, of course, you know, in 1976, I was just drooling over these uh, Norlin era Les Pauls, which now start of, have started to be seen as vintage, but at the time I didn't know it, but were probably the, the thought of as being the sort of most questionable Les Pauls built to date. Um, I, I, James, I wonder how heavy is that, uh, is your 74, um, the fellow, the early part of the stream said that his, his, um, Les Paul three pickup custom is a, um, uh, weighs 11 and a half pounds, which isn't the biggest number I've ever heard. Let's see. I want to make sure I got questions. So that does that, was that the question you had, Steve? It was, was it the mahogany guitar question? Um. 
Uh, Stuart McClellan says that he has a 78 antique burst Les Paul Custom, one of two New Orleans. Cool. So that's definitely a maple neck. I'll bet you the maple neck's beautiful with the antique burst on it. Chris Butler. Uh, ah, so the original run of Les Paul Customs were all three pickup guitars. No, I guess I, I did all this too fast. So the original run from 54 to 1957, when they went to the humbucking pickups were two pickups, a P90 in the bridge and a different style of pickup called the typically called the staple pickup, which is constructed in a different way and actually is thought of as being brighter, snappier in the neck. Um, those were used until the humbuckers came out in 1957. Um, so uh, if you had, if you had a buddy that had a 79 or 80, kind of all rules were off once they brought the guitars back in 68. I don't think they made a lot of three pickup ones right out of the box. Um, but, um, but that's true. Uh, John says, John Trim says that he heard that, uh, Frampton sanded, the guitar had been sanded body thickness wise than standard could be. That's interesting. I'll have to, it'll be, it would be a good video to do that, to do that one guitar. Chris says his was a two pickup custom. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, my knees hurt <laughs> after three back surgeries. The weight of things matters. I actually sold, I got a um, Princeton Tone Master amp in because um, I got my um, GA40, Gibson GA40 clone that I had built with Dan Lurie at FYD Amps. Man, I must have built that amp a dozen years ago. I got it back from Bill Sanderson, traded him for a Victory Deluxe head, which kind of was too big for the living room, just space wise. And since I had this GA40 in a Princeton size, I thought to ask the guys at Fender to send me so I could check it out. And it's nice enough that I sold both of my Tone Master Deluxes. The guy that bought it, um, his band just started rehearsing on a third or fourth floor walk up. <laughs> and he literally, he just learned he was going to have to uh, work in this space. And he he drove out from Rochester and I met him out by the throughway. Um, so he'd have this amp. And when I handed him, I had the original box, of course, I handed him the box. And if anybody's ever handled a Tone Master Deluxe box, you're, it's this big box because it's still the size of a Deluxe. But you pick it up and you think the amp's not in it because it just weighs so little. Um, so uh, let's see. You guys are all talking to each other. I like that. So um, more questions? We got a lot of time today. I talk too fast, as always. How enlightening, says Smokey Robinson, the Miracles guitarist, Marv Tarplin, has footage on YouTube playing a three pickup custom. Also some record covers. Yeah, cool. Um, the Somebody mentioned Jimmy Page's guitar. My favorite part of that story was, of course, the guitar was stolen in 1980. But before that, when he still had the three pickup is when um, Joe Walsh offered him his the guitar that be, became his number one guitar. Um, a 59 to which Jimmy Page responded, I already have a Les Paul. <laughs> I mean, at that point, he was already on with Led Zeppelin. And the idea that, you know, you could tell that you, you don't come from money that even if you're a big rock star, you still go, I already have one of those. I don't I don't need another Les Paul, <laughs> which cracked me up. So um, uh, Frank Glad, I was talking, said I had a three pickup Les Paul artisan and you didn't finish that, but I have to think that the Les Paul Artisans were early 80s. Um, I think they're very cool. Uh, I, excuse me, I remember seeing them. The fretboard inlays almost look like they came off like the old 50s banjos. They were very cool. Uh, Nick Patterson must have got here after I told the Fogarty story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you nailed it. That's just what I said earlier. Um, Chris Butler says, I was considering one of the Tone Master amps, but I have some reticence after some good points made in Psionic Audio's best amps under blank series. That, and I'm broke. Well, broke is always the best way to not buy too much gear. That's for sure. It's the best excuse to not do that. Um, oh, guitar, 1950. Gary's uh, artisan was a 75. Yeah, I think they were mid-70s guitars. I remember seeing them in the case, and they would have been, they would have stayed there Um a while because they were very expensive guitars, uh, even when they came out. Yeah, that's right. Steve Jones of the when the with the pistol Sex Pistols um, it was a seventy four aged white. It's also a seventy four. That's right. Uh, let's see. 
Perry says, I'm pretty sure Buckingham played the white custom on their eponymous, I can never say that word, album tour, given that there is footage of him playing a year before. Oh, sorry. He had it before that, but he didn't really pay it after the rumors tour is what I was trying to say. So Perry's, Perry's definitely um, great at all those details. Uh, one thing that I was interested in was in the mid seventies, they also started doing after they did that run in 74, they ended up coming out with other custom, um, other colors for the custom. And, um, one of the, um, <laughs> Beato calling me never remembers when I'm doing my stream. Um, uh, they came out with a number of different colors. They came out with, um, they did the black and the white, of course, but they did transparent blue and they did transparent red, like like the deluxes that um, Pete Townsend had added the middle pickup to. And that red one is the one that probably Jerry Cantrell is most famous for playing with Alice in Chains. And when Gibson did a signature guitar, it was that. I miss, I thought when, you know, from because of the color, I was focused on the color. Um, I thought that perhaps it was a mid seventies, but in fact, uh, Jerry said in an interview when he did the signature guitar that he bought all four, he bought four guitars uh, kind of at the beginning of Alice in Chains around the time of their first record, he bought one of each, basically one of those, each of those four colors. So let's see. <laughs> Thanks. Chris is giving me, um, uh, pronunciation le lessons. Uh, it's kind of like the feeling I have Chris when I'm working on my French, uh, on Duolingo and I say it exactly the way I heard it and it still doesn't accept it. So such is the way. Uh, Eddie's Guitars, uh, New York Shelby GT says, Eddie's Guitars has a ridiculous Nordic blue quilt Les Paul with all guard hardware, three pickups and Bigsby. Yeah, you know, so once once the Les Paul custom shop comes on the scene and actually early in, there's there was three years um, when, when I was reading Dave Hunter's book, which I should plug here because Dave is the authority, his Les Paul book is the authority that I go to first when I start a script like this. Um, Dave said basically that for the first few years in the eighties, um, there was no custom shop, but if you ordered a Gibson, uh, a Les Paul custom, it was to your spec. You could order it any way you wanted with any kind of hardware, with anything that they would, you know, were doing at the factory at the time. Um, and then when the custom shop was put together in the early nineties in 94, actually, um, and Phil Jones, who I've, I've talked about here, who was one of the first employees there and I've talked about it with him, um, the reality is then kind of all the historical rules were off. Even in 68, as I said, from 68 on, they're really just really fancy dressed up Les Pauls. Um, so anyway. Nitro says those Cantrell signatures might be the best sounding Les Pauls I've ever heard. Might be only ones that made me reconsider my distaste for them. But woof, that price tag. Yeah, I think they're nine. I think they're nine grand. Um, Ivan Roman Romanenko, Ivan, how are you, man? You're learning French too? <laughs> oh, that's right. You're in, you're in Quebec. Um, well, you know, I, um, I, I used to joke, uh, when I lived in Burlington, Vermont, I dated somebody from, uh, Montreal for a year. And um, she'd always correct my pronunciation. And I always joked that I would end up speaking French the way that um, Audrey Hepburn did, that I'd, I'd sound like a, a pretty French, if I was lucky, pretty, a pretty French woman speaking French. Um, and, uh, and I used to question her corrections. But yeah, yeah, you got to learn French if you're going to be getting a PhD in Quebec, my friend. Um, Paul Toledo uh, wants to know if they're uh, all of them are considered fretless wonders. No, the fretless, they went to a different fret size when they went to a more standard fret size when they brought the guitars back in 1968. So it would just be the original run of the guitars from 1954 to 1960 that the, that I was talking about earlier, that original 1920 guitars. <laughs> yeah, I could have taken, I could have long ago taken Fogarty down and put myself back on the screen. Um, I, I actually had one of those custom amps, uh, producer, man, those two are really cool. So I understand the fixation. 
Jack Howell says, never make fun of someone who mispronounces a word. It just means that they learned it by reading. Oh, that's I read, I've read too much over the years. I joke that I, I'm um, mildly dyslexic, so I, I now misspell words in three different languages since I study Dutch and French. Um, yeah, the different French in Canada is from the 16th century, um, Perry. Oh, baby. Uh, the funny, th I'll tell you a quick funny BB Ninja story. Um, when, when I first encountered BB on a forum, um, I, I don't know why the ninja part, uh, I, I started like telling, trying my little bits of Japanese that I know and BB came right back. <laughs> it's, it was like the beginning of BB never being stumped or nonplussed. It just goes right, goes right through it. It's too funny. So, um, Ivan wants to know, anybody know if the necks are fat on the 50s and 50s inspired Les Paul Customs? Uh, you know, it changes all that stuff changes all the time. It should be. Um, I can tell you that um, there's a lot of debate. You know, as I said, there's there were only, uh, what's the estimate, 1712 original Sunburst guitars from 58 through 60. That's always the joke. Um, but um, there's a huge variety of neck sizes, even in ones that weren't, you know, messed with. Um, so you, all of the neck size shapes, those kinds of things, whether it's Gibson or, or Fender, there was a ton of handwork. I mean, it's even, even now, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but, um, um, matter of fact, I should say, um, uh, David Grissom has a PRS DGT SE model coming out with PRS and David's agreed to be on a live stream on the 19th of January. And the guys from PRS are going to send me one and so we can check it out. But supposedly the third in the third video today, um, they sent him one and they modeled it on his gold top that he's had for a long, long time. He actually sold the guitar and got it back in the last few years. Um, but um, they the funny part was that they he took the, you know, the SE guitar out and he's playing it and, and he's like, yeah, you know, at the 12th fret doesn't seem doesn't seem quite right. And Jack Higginbottom, who's the uh, chief operating officer at prs is on the zoom call with him and he's like yeah yeah we knew that it's two thousandths of an inch off and you noticed it so i i love that i love the the detaily persnickety i'm sure we will give him grief about it and actually as soon as that guitar was announced somebody put in my instagram feed that um uh when i had david on the show last time um it, he mentioned how cool that would be and uh, Jeff Macrolane is really long time, really, really good friends with David. And um, <laughs> baby, figures you'd know. It was Grissom's birthday yesterday. That's great. Um, anyway, uh, David never mentioned it. Two years. They've been working on it for two years. And, and he, didn't, he didn't, not a peep. Um, although I think I'll go, somebody told me to do it. I'm going to go back to the live stream and grab the clip where he says, yeah, that would be cool. And when we do the one we have him on the live stream, I'll play the clip. So um questions i could i could play i could play something for you so the thing that you heard at the beginning was i'll give you a little somebody was talking about um black beauty porn here um i'm sure that's really terrible for the algorithm but i have the a clip of um rabia playing um the music that you heard at the beginning so let me run that and it's like a minute and 20 long so
<laughs> that sounds so good. Uh, I love that clip. Um, Chris Butler wanted to know if that was the amp. Yeah, that's the amp that I have. And I've said it before, those VC35s um, have way more gain on tap. They're a 4EL84, you know, mildly like, um, but substantially different than, a, than an AC30. Um, and they do some amazing kind of British EL34 kind of tones. They have mid mid push sweep and stuff. And, um, and that's that. Uh, Andy uh, Bunger was asking if I had spent much time talking. I just quickly, Andy went past um, the 54 to 56 um, L, um, P90 in the bridge and um, staple pickup in the neck. I am going to spend quite a bit of time on it um, uh, in the video itself. So you'll have, there'll be quite a bit of detail. I'll actually go into a bit of detail about that pickup because that was the first guitar that it appeared in. They ended up using that in very high-end jazz guitars, the L5, CES, and those kinds of things. But um, uh, that's, um, yeah, that was it. So yeah, the guys at Victory, uh, Peter Baroni saying nice collab. The, the guys at Victory um, have given me permission to use that clip in the video. And so I brought it over here because I just thought that that 71 sounded amazing. Um, it's had a neck break. It's had, you know, kind of all the wear and tear on it. Um, and I think, I think he said he bought it at Norm's Rare Guitars when he was in LA for a, um, uh, for a NAMM show. Uh, Chris Quinn wants to know if I've ever played a Bernie custom. Chris, I've never played. No, that's not true. I did play a custom Black Beauty at House of Guitars like when I was a kid, 17 or 18. They were, they were amazingly generous. I, I think maybe because they couldn't tell. We all were dressed like, you know, this <laughs> in 1970s, in the late 70s. I don't think they could tell who had money, um, but uh, but they let me play one. But that was the only time and the only time. And I and we didn't, you know, like I didn't see Bernie's and stuff until, wow, and Greco's and stuff. I wasn't aware of them until much, much later. Um, uh, Johnny A says, Bare Knuckles makes cool P90 10K. Make sure Junior sound like EVH. You know, uh, actually the guys at Lawler, I know I'm sure others do, but the guys at Lawler, and the guys at, um, oh, Jeff, Jeff's gone. Um, throwback, make uh, staple pickups and um, and people rave about them. Um, you know, one of the things to remember about PAFs is they weren't trying to make it a pickup that sounded different. They were just looking to make a pickup that was quiet. Um, they liked the sound of the P90 sound. That was, a, that was the sound of a Gibson. Um, that's what they wanted, so. Let's see. Oh, Jeff's here. See, Jeff, you would have saved me. Uh, yeah, Kurt uh, Schaffenberg, that's obviously the sound. And also he's playing a drop, of course. It could even have been an E-flat. I don't know. Somebody got an E-flat guitar nearby? Oh, I do. I have this new guitar. People didn't see it. So I was talking about Ish, and this would be like the segue to the end. Um, I put up a picture. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you should. I put this up. They did a Wood Library run of these modern Eagle fives. And you've heard me say that I'm just not, I'm just not a Strat guy. Um, but this, especially with an EQ pedal, this gets very stratty. You can make this single coil, this single coil. It's not really a split. It's actually a true single coil. Um, this is a, a Wood Library one. I was asking people's opinions of the color. Obviously it's a pretty sick quilt top and a beautiful stain job. It's, it's ash back and, um, a maple, flame, really crazy flame maple neck that's been stained. Um, so, you know, jump in there and say whether you like it or you hate it. Um, I have this tuned in E flat. Yeah, I think, I think he's an E flat drop. Yeah, he is for sure, which is a typical Rabia thing. He has, uh, right in that same video, he plays an Esquire and he has an e, one in E flat. Oh, so if you ever worry about uh, about me, about people offering me guitars, I actually got an email right before the stream today where I said at the end of the Esquire video that it's one of the few guitars that I uh, I regret not holding on to until this point. And somebody wrote to me and said um, that um, <laughs> that they have one, of course, you know, so and I was just talking to Zach Childs about I've never played a Bender either. Uh, so um, that would be a cool, a cool project guitar. Um, good. I, I like it that people are jumping in there. How's the middle usually pickup usually wired? This is one of those things where people coming in out of the stream. Um, the three pickup, the three way switch on a three pickup guitar is neck, middle and bridge and bridge only. That's the three different positions. 
<laughs> Paul, Paulie, Pablo, Paola, Paolo says blasphemy. And I think he's referring to the fact that I picked up my PRS on a stream about Gibsons. I'll probably get plenty of hate for that. And maybe I deserve it. I'm not sure. So, um, okay. Last questions. I always say that, um, with trepidation because of Perry being here. Do you have a preference for 50s wiring or modern wiring with treble bypass on a Les Paul style two guitars, two pickup and two volume guitars? Um, so the only guitars that I have that are set that way are my 390s. Um, they are 50s style wiring, or I think they were built in Memphis. I can't remember they called it something Memphis wiring. They're 50s style wiring. Um, and I had the R9 that I had was also 50s style wiring. Uh, I really liked it. Um, some people will say it's a little twitchy, you know, like you, there's, but I find in general, there's always a place where it starts to kick in. Uh, I got my Strandberg Esquire back from the guys and I had it wired to traditional 50 spec where it was wide open, no tone control, tone control. And then the mud position that they had, the original one uh, was a 0.5 capacitor and we used a smaller one. I'm going to go to a little bigger one because I want it to be like a jazzier tone. Um, but you know, that's a three position thing as well. So working on that. Um, so I like fifties, I like 50 style wiring. And, uh, I have to say that because Jeff would be all over me if I didn't say that. <laughs> Perry's Perry is what is the average air velocity, airspeed velocity of an unladen sparrow to which I think the appropriate Monty Python response is a European or an African sparrow, but I could be remembering that wrong. That's from, um, the whole Monty Python, the Holy grail. Jimmy Page had a six-way switch, New York City Shelby, six-way switch on his Black Beauty, and you can buy the wiring kit. I'm not surprised because, um, of course, he was doing all kinds of stuff on the fly in the in the studio. There we go. Andy Bugger jumped right in, African or European Sparrow, and then the bridge guy goes flying into the thing. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Okay. All right, guys. Well, hey, we're running out of time. Uh, thanks for hanging. And... Um, Fat Philosopher, Shane wants to know, did the Tellys have brass saddles for the tone? Well, that's like one for Zach. Um, I'm sure that they decided on a, a metal that worked, was easily worked, worked well, and was not that expensive, knowing Leo Fender. I'm sure it kind of kicked all those boxes. So uh, I want to wish everybody happy holidays. Um, and uh, I will, the new video is going to be out next week on the 29th Thursday. And like I said, if you're on friends of five watt, $10 or up level, then um, you'll see it Wednesday night. And like the, the whole gang does. And then um, I'll be back. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I think we're, I think Jeff and I have on the calendar to do the Jeff Beck uh, guitars of Jeff Beck short history. Um, and then, uh, but we've got um, uh, Perry Nielsen coming and we've got David Grissom coming for live streams in January. So the first two live streams are January. I guess both live streams of January are all done. Um, so um, thanks so much for everybody for being here. Uh, I think it's cool that somebody said <laughs> that they're in the same golf club with Grissom. I didn't know that David played golf. So that doesn't sound like a very guitar rock and roll thing to do, but I, I guess that's cool. Uh, who would question David? He is the coolest. Thanks again for everybody. Thanks for being here. And I will see you all next time. I'm going to play the Revia clip as the segue out. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Take a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks.
Wow.